I'm Lisa Stone. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Parenting Aces. Tennisballs.com is your one-stop shop for all the latest tennis news, stories, and photos from around the world. Their talented writers share insights from the Pro Tour, the latest tennis technology, and behind-the-scenes looks at your favorite tennis tournaments and events. Check out Tennisballs.com. That's 10sballs.com. I'm so excited to have John O'Sullivan, the founder and CEO of Changing the Game Project, back on the Parenting Aces podcast this week. John started Changing the Game Project back in 2012, and he comes from the soccer world, but much of what he writes about and talks about really crosses all youth sports. And I've had him on the show previously. He does a great job of talking about what's wrong with youth sports today and how we can give sports back to our kids. John has done a TED Talk. He's written for the Huffington Post. He's spoken at the IMG Academy. And I'm just so thrilled to have him back with us this week. In this week's podcast, you're going to hear us talk a little bit about how to choose the best coach for your child and what it means for a coach to be transactional versus transformational. We'll also talk about finding the involvement sweet spot for parents and coaching your child, making that decision to act both as parent and coach for your child's junior development journey. So without further ado, I bring you John O'Sullivan. Welcome to the Parenting Aces podcast. I'm your host, Lisa Stone, and we are with Coach John O'Sullivan of Changing the Game Project. John, thanks so much for joining us on the podcast this week. Lisa, thanks so much for having me back on. It's, It's been a while, but it's always an honor to be here. Well, thank you. And you are now an official member of the podcaster world, so welcome to that. And I have been greatly enjoying your shows and look forward to hearing them each week. And um, I I want to encourage my listeners to check you out, too. Um, And maybe you can share some info on your podcast a little later in the show. But for now, because I know you are a busy guy, I want to jump right in and The impetus behind the conversation today is an article that you recently posted on the Changing the Game Project website um, about transactional coaching versus transformational coaching. And I'm hoping that you can give our listeners a definition of each. I will include a link to the article in the show notes so um, people can check that out on their own time. But Let's talk about these two different approaches to coaching youth sports. Sure. Well, I, you know, I think one of the, the best coaching books I've ever read is Joe Ehrman's book, Inside Out Coaching. And, and he, he talks about this, this idea of transactional versus transformational. Transactional would be sort of, you paid for this, so this is what you get. Whereas transformational is all about serving the athlete, putting the needs and the values and the priorities of the athlete first, the, the the team second, and the coach third. Where sort of a transaction, it's sort of everything's equivalent, or the needs of the club or the needs of the coach come first. And uh, so I'd read that book a while ago, and then I had read. Uh, I was inspired to write that article by a, a blog post just by one of my favorite writers, Seth Godin, talking about how so many organizational organizations treat their people. As their relationship as a transaction, right? You paid for this, we gave you what you paid for. And it really made me think about sports coaching and, and how many sports organizations treat their people like that. You paid for X amount of hours of practice, and that's what we gave you. You paid for this many tournaments, and that's what we gave you. And, and I truly believe that sports can be so much more. It can be transformational. It can be about, yeah, you paid for that, but what we've really done is we are investing in you, the person, and we are giving you, the person, all this stuff um, so that the, when you walk out of here, you're not just a better tennis player or a better soccer player, but you're a, a better human being. And that organizations and coaches that start doing that, what they're going to see is that their businesses will start growing fast and growing well. 
It's such an interesting approach, and and I know you come from the soccer world. I come from the tennis world, but we both come from the world of kids playing a sport and the the world of we want our children to be exposed to coaches who are going to be life impactors for our children, right? Yeah, uh, correct, and and I think some, you know, some people look back on their child sports experience and they consider like, wow, how lucky we were to have those type of great coaches. Whereas other people look back with regret and say, you know, I never looked at those qualities when we were looking for a coach or looking for a, a program for our kids. And I think certainly in the tennis world where your coaching is really on an individual level, much more so than, you know, being part of a big soccer club with 2,000 kids and kind of, you know, you're, you're on a team, whatever team you make, that's the coach you get. Whereas, you know, in tennis, you're, you're, you're searching out, you know, that specific coach to train your son or to, to train your daughter. And I think you can be so much more intentional there about not just how much this, this coach is players have won or scholarships, but look at the interaction. And and are, are those kids feeling better about themselves? Are they falling in love with this sport that they can play for the rest of their lives? Or is it just, again, this transaction of, well, I gave you exposure to college coaches or I got you into such and such a tournament? And I, and, and I think the opportunity for tennis coaches as well is, I mean, this is an incredible opportunity for, for you to set yourself apart from others because you can be incredibly demanding and, and, and be a fantastic teacher of this game of tennis for your kids while at the same time building that incredible connection with your athletes so that they'll actually become better tennis players as well. And if you build that connection, now you're developing people and not just, not just tennis players. Exactly. You know, I've written a lot about that exact idea, you know, the life lessons that that our children can learn from playing an individual sport like tennis. And, you know, I share experiences that I had and that my child has had. And um, it's it's about so much more than hitting the ball or winning a trophy or even getting a college scholarship, you know, it's about um, developing these human beings who are going to have to go out into the world and be successful with their relationships, be successful with their careers, um, hopefully be game changers themselves in terms of making a positive difference out in the world. And I think a lot of coaches don't, for whatever reason, they don't think about that aspect of the impact that they can have on these kids. And you, for some reason, seem to get that pretty early in your own coaching career. How did you get there? Oh, I, I wouldn't give myself too much credit on that front. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm 45 now, and it definitely took me a couple of years of, of, of coaching before I, I realized that. And maybe I was lucky enough that early on, one of the first teams that I coached was, you know, some high school juniors and seniors. And so they were moving on in their lives and mature enough to take something from that experience. And, and one of those kids very early in my experience before I was married, before I had my own children, called me up after he finished college and was going to medical school just to say thanks and, and told me how much he thought of my words when he encountered difficult situations and he needed to push through things. And for me, that was a really shocking thing because I didn't expect that at all. And so that was my aha moment as a coach to say, wait a sec, you remember what I said to you back at halftime of the such and such game, or you still remember my words from here on out. And what that made me really think about was, you know, for every kid like that who I had a great relationship with and, and I, I knew that I had done well with him, I started thinking about all the kids that I hadn't connected with, that I had dismissed too easily, that I didn't invest in because they weren't exactly like me as a player. I didn't think they cared as much. And that's what was really scary for me. So I would say that was my aha moment to open my eyes that, wait a sec, maybe there's something more than more to coaching than this. 
and, and, and then I was just lucky enough to have enough mentors in the coaching space, people that I looked up to, coaches that were incredibly successful in the wins and losses who took the time to take me aside and say, you know, John, it's not about the practices you run. It's about your connections with your players. And seeing them and being mentored by them encouraged me to have the courage to say, yeah, it's not just the drills I run. It's not just the periodization of training. It's not all these easy things to measure. It's really the what we call soft skills that matter most. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, I mean, interesting that it took somebody, a kid calling you years after your contact with him to – make you realize that because surely he was not the first person that you touched in that way. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's always interesting to me because I've never coached. So I really don't, you know, have any kind of firsthand insights into that world, but I've certainly been around enough coaches. And I think, you know, finally, after I've already gone through all this with my kids, um, I'm starting to understand what a good coach looks like and what a not so good coach looks like. And it's one of the things that, that you just said is this whole idea of having a mentor or multiple mentors Can you talk about how coaches can seek out or recognize other coaches that can serve in that role for them? And and I've I've had actually people tell me it doesn't even necessarily have to be somebody in your same field or sport. It can be somebody, you know, totally unconnected with tennis or, or sports in general. Exactly. And so I'll I'll add this that, first of all, it's, you know, knowing what a great coach looks like. And deep down, we're all just teachers, right? We're mentors, we're teachers. So what I say to people is when you think about the qualities of your best coach, if you never, if you're like, I never had a good coach. I, I, most people have crossed paths with a great teacher once in their life, right? Someone who just inspired them to love a subject that they then continued on in their career or just made them feel good about themselves. And when you think about what are the qualities of that person, um, it's not about, oh, they sure knew a lot about history or, boy, they were good at algebra, right? It's that they they loved me. They connected with me. They respected me. They they were fair. They were trustworthy. Um, they were passionate. They were inspiring. It's all about that connection. So I think everyone out there, even if you have never coached, you know what an influential, inspirational teacher feels like. And that's what coaches have to become for their kids. And and you know that in your own experience, man, I if I did that, um, my players would play better for me, right? And they would take feedback better, right? They would care how much I know because they know how much I care to steal Teddy Roosevelt's line. And so I think as coaches start reaching out and looking for, for mentors, right, don't just look at for the one who, who wins all the time or, or whatever. Look at, um, you know, which, which, which families right go back to the same coach with multiple kids um which tennis coach is um you know coach coach some you know maybe who's been in coaching a long time who now his first students or her first students their kids are taking lessons from them right someone that they trusted so much that they brought their own kids them those are the type of people and exactly go outside of your sport cuz one of the most I think most sports, there, there's ego involved among, amongst coaches, that if I sit in a room with a bunch of soccer coaches, we're all worried about who knows the most about soccer, and so that stifles discussion, and I don't want to say anything that makes me sound stupid, but if, we, if I sit in a room with a tennis coach and a volleyball coach and um, a basketball coach, and we talk about coaching, we rise above the X's and O's and we meet in the middle. And I know that the tennis person knows more about tennis and the basketball person knows more about basketball, but let's meet in the middle. How do we inspire athletes? How do we motivate? How do we set standards? How do we build teams? How do we build culture? All these things matter a ton. And I I truly believe that that's why there's a great value to having mentors outside of your sport as well as within your sport. 
For sure. And it's interesting because I think in the tennis world, we tend to be very insular. And, you know, tennis coaches hang out with other tennis people and uh, tennis parents hang out with other tennis parents. And and I think it is very eye-opening and educational to go outside your sport because there are a lot of lessons to be learned from other sports, even from other endeavors, from the arts, from you know, from mathematics, from uh, chess that can be applied and help us be more successful in in our sport of tennis. Yeah, well, well without a doubt. And, you know, you know, so last summer in Boulder, Dr. Jerry Lynch and I ran uh, this event called the Way of Champions Conference. And one of the attendees was um, a man named Kirk Anderson, who was about two months from retirement as the head of sport development or, or coaching um, from, from the U.S. Tennis Association, right? And Kirk was one of the people who really got behind the youth tennis initiatives and, and making um, kids' tennis a little more user-friendly and everything. But here he was near the end of his official capacity, and he's still out there learning, and he's there connecting and sharing with golf coaches and skiing coaches and soccer coaches and football and ice hockey coaches and and sitting there thinking, you know, what can I get out of this? And what was really cool about that event was, you know, we had the director of sport development from U.S. Volleyball and we had top soccer people and we had um, someone from USA Swimming and someone from the International Table Tennis Federation all in a room seeking out how can we get better and then how can we take this back to the people that we work with so we can make them better. And I really do think that the best coaches are lifelong learners and they're willing to look everywhere and anywhere for that next little gem. Whereas sometimes the not those who would like to think that they're great, they're done learning. This is my way, it's my way or the highway. Um, and I don't think those are the type of people that you want your kids around. For sure. So let's get back to this whole notion of transformational coaching. And it's not just about transforming a player from, you know, stage one to stage two um, on the field or on the court. It's about much more than that. Can you expand on that idea of what it means to be a transformational coach? Well, I, I think one of the most important things to think about is this, and and everyone who has either coached kids through their teens or parented teens knows that at some point in your life, you know, your your kid's going to start thinking you're the dumbest person in the world, and they're not going to listen to you, and and you really want them around good, positive people because that might be the most powerful voice in their head. Um, and that's where I think coaches can really play this great role in, A, sometimes we have kids who don't have a positive father figure or a positive female figure in their life. And, and, then, and then, B, maybe they do have that positive figure, but yet they're at the time of their life where, where they think their parents aren't, aren't paying attention. And so your voice goes way beyond the court at that point. And, and what you say and, and, the, and what you live, most importantly, how you act is – a model for your athletes, right? If, if you're always saying, hey, what, you know, especially in tennis, which is realistically, you know, it's a game of integrity when you're playing in tournaments and you're calling balls out and you're doing that, right? What, what are you, what, what is that coach teaching if they're saying, hey, here's how to get an advantage or don't make that call there or, you know, don't call that foul on yourself or things like that, Um you know, I, I think these are really important things that we have to realize. Um, those things go beyond the tennis court. What you're teaching kids is what am I willing to compromise to win in life as, as well. And so all those things, you know, kids are the kids are not always great listeners, but they're great imitators. And so they will imitate the people that we hold up to them as these are people to imitate. And any coach is that. And so anyone who thinks that your influence is neutral is wrong. And anyone who thinks that your influence only has to do with what happens in sport is wrong as well. And so you've just got to see that bigger picture um, and, and, and then say, okay, how am I, you know, what, how is my influence? Is it positive or negative? And, and adjust accordingly. And, and again, that's all about recognizing um, that 
you're not coaching a sport, you're coaching a person. And this person might show up one day and they just need a hug. They need to feel good about themselves because everything else in their life is going down the toilet. And another day they might need a kick in the butt. And, and it's your job as a coach to recognize that and, and um, you know, tiptoe across that line day to day, you know, developing both the person and the player. It's occurring to me as you're talking that a transactional coach is actually transformational too, just not in a positive manner, right? <laughs> Could be. <laughs> I mean, yeah. if, if they only care about the X's and the O's and the W's and the L's, um, they're sending a message pretty loud and clear to their players as well. Yeah, and and again, I think this is, especially if we're developing, you, you know, you think you're, that you're pushing someone on to the elite level. I mean, character matters, and so, and, and so, if you're you're not intentionally developing their character and they go on to a college tennis program and they're a lousy teammate, they're going to be out the door. Um, if you're not intentionally developing their character and they become a pro, what's going to happen when they have lots of time and lots of fame? They're going to start making bad decisions. So I always look at you know professional athletes that make bad decisions, and oftentimes in my world, my first thought is, how many coaches had an opportunity to, to say to that athlete, uh-uh, that's not how things are done here, right? And and didn't because he or she was very good, right? Like, you know, Allen Iverson, fantastic basketball player who go on rants about how practice didn't matter. How many coaches did Allen Iverson have, right, who, who let him get away with not working hard in practice because he was still the best player there? And so I think yeah. this is the role that coaches have over and over and over is is what is your standard – and and when you have a standard, you always got to call the behavior what it is. For sure, for sure. It's funny. We last week's podcast um, we addressed the topic of cheating in tennis, and uh, it, it turned into a, a quite interesting discussion about how basically the fabric of society nowadays is such that it's easy to cheat and lie and get away with it. People do it all the time, and, and they get praised for it, basically. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and we hold them up so, as, 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 as examples instead of saying, and, and you know, I, I forget that there was that great uh, tennis video of a professional tournament not a while back where, where um, the one player, you know, basically overruled the umpire. Do, do you remember what yeah. I'm talking about? You might remember yeah, it was it Jack Sock. It was yeah, Jack yeah, Sock. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He just said, no, that yeah. was out or whatever it was. I thought it was great. Yeah. Or that was in. It was. Um, yeah. That, well, that's the example that we have to hold up. It, it's one of the things, to be honest, that I do like about golf is that golfers call fouls on themselves. Golfers keep, you know, you know and, it's, and it's very taboo. <laughs> to not do such things. And so I, I mm -hmm. wish more sports would learn from that. Yeah, me too. Me too. Well, let's kind of shift gears a little bit. And um, I want to talk about being a good sports parent because this is another thing that you write a lot about and and uh, you talk a lot about in, you know, your TED Talk and your the different uh, podcasts that you're doing now. And one of the podcasts that I listened to of yours was the one with Dan Abrahams, and um, I think it was Dan who first used the phrase, the sweet spot of involvement for sports parents, and that just really, like, stuck with me. Um, I thought that was such a great phrase, the sweet spot of involvement. Let's talk a little bit about that and how do parents find that, because in sports, I mean, soccer, you've got travel soccer and you've got the over-involved. Where my kids grew up, we had the soccer moms, and I know that's kind of one of those negative labels that people like to place on sports parents. But um, in tennis, we have the same thing, you know, the over-involved parent. But there's a fine line between doing what's necessary to help your child achieve their goals and then stepping over that line and becoming, you know, the, the witch. <laughs> so 
how do we find the sweet spot, John? Yeah, and that's a it's a great point. Yeah, and so you know, on the podcast, and I, I mean, I think Dan Abrahams was the second person that we that we interviewed for Way of Champions podcast, and I, and I love that phrase too. It was something that really stuck out for me. This idea of you know what's the sweet spot, and you know, I think what we have to recognize as parents is that the sweet spot's a moving target, <laughs> right? There are going to be times in our kids' lives where... That's not what I wanted you to say. That's, that yeah. is way too complicated. <laughs> but it is complicated. And, and what I mean by that is, is, is that that moving target, you know, there's going to, when your kids are really young, you know, it's up to you as the parent to know better. Right. I, I always use the example of if people say, oh, my kid only wants to play soccer. And I say, well, my kid, my seven year old only wants to eat macaroni and cheese. Right. You know, but as a parent, I know he has to eat vegetables. And so that's where I step in and say, uh, uh-uh. but as a kid gets to become 16, um, if they're saying, you know what, I really don't, you know, I'm not feeling that I want to play tennis year round right now. There's other things I want to do. That's not necessarily your job to say, "Uh uh-uh, you're going to do this and you're going to get this private coach and you're going to do that and we're going to work through it because then that can make them them hate it. And so um, the sweet spot is this big area of that that really starts with great communication, that you have this relationship with your kids where you are truly listening to what they're saying about, let's just talk about their sports experience, and you are – you, you know, you're saying, okay, what are your goals? How can I help? Because you own this experience, right? And you're constantly checking in with, you know, are, are you still enjoying this? Or, you know, do you need to you know, back off for a tiny bit? And, you know, when you talk about the tennis world, I mean, there, there was, you know, a, a study of tennis players um, by a, a, a Polish sports scientist many years ago where he looked at sort of the the um, top 12 and under tennis players in the world and then check back 10 years later how many of them were top 100 on the tour. And that group, you know, of junior tennis players included people like Roger Federer and Kim Kleisters and stuff. And what he found was that amongst those kids with the role of parents was they call it, you know, they were involved but not pushy. So they were involved and connected to the things that their kids were doing, but they were basically helping their kids chase after their dreams and their passions. They weren't trying to say, this is what you should be passionate about. And and I think this is, as a parent, we're always checking back in and saying, well, is this a good thing right now or or is it not? Um, and, and, you know, like I, you know, one of the conversations, uh, you know, I, I had a couple years ago with Peter Smith, the men's tennis coach at USC, who talked about just with his own kids how, they got better and fell more in love with tennis when he kind of backed off, or at least when he said, you know, when practice ended, coaching ended. Um, Mm -hmm. And he let them just be, you know, it was dad to kids in their relationship as well. And so as a parent, you know, we can help our kids, but we have to take account their state of mind and take into account, um, or do they own this? Are they chasing after the things that that they want? Um, Not necessarily what we think they could be or or should be you know when I had my first child and she's now 28 um my dad said to me this is the hardest thing you're ever going to do just going to tell you that right now (laughs) like you think it's hard with a newborn just wait and he was right you know it parenting is so difficult and even when you think you're done you're not done and Mm -hmm. Even when you think you have it figured out, your kid throws you a curveball, and you have to totally reassess and regroup. And just when you think you figured it out with one kid, the next kid comes along who requires a whole different set of approaches. So it's, you know, this whole idea of the sweet spot, um, while it sounds good, it's, it's a fleeting thing. I mean, even if you find it, you're only there for the moment, and then, like you said, the sweet spot shifts, and and you better play catch up. Yeah, and and again, I mean, it's just it's amazing to me. And again, as my as a parent, I I work 
very hard at this with, with my own kids of just staying connected to the discussion, right? It's very hard for me as someone who loved team sports my whole life to realize that I have a son who doesn't like team sports, right? And and so I, I could ma- I could force him to do all the team sports that I loved or I could really listen to him and say, well, what do you love doing? Let me help you do those things. And, you know, that part is has been a fantastic eye opener for me of hey let me let me help him out and maybe that changes someday that's fine as well my daughter loves the team sport thing the more people at some event the the merrier she just wants to meet more people and more people and more people and so you know she she's a very easy child for me to parent in the sports realm because she loves all the same stuff that I do and mm-hmm. um and and realize and, and you know looking at my two kids and wondering like were you two really raised in the same house and you ate the same food and did the same things because you couldn't be any more different when it comes to <laughs> to this aspect of life it's a really hard thing to do but um, it's a very important thing to do as well for sure and that that whole notion of communication um, that's another theme that keeps coming up it's so I, I feel like I need to go back and listen to all five and a half years of my podcasts and. I feel like the theme of mentors and communication are two that come up more often than any other theme. So that must mean there's something to that and that we as parents better start paying attention to that. Yeah, and I think yeah, I, I think it's George Bernard Shaw who says the greatest problem with communication is the illusion that it has taken place. And I think a lot of kids feel very that they're talked at, but they're never listened to. And there's ways to listen to your kids, right? You know, put down the phones, just be present, just find that mo- moment, put everything else aside, turn the TV off, and, and listen and validate what you know what they say. So again, my friend Jerry Lynch, he calls this "love your kids, listen, understand, validate." L U V. Right. And and when you do that, um, it, you know, you paraphrase what they just said. So what I'm hearing from you is this that tells your kids that you've listened to what them said. Right. And you validate their reasons for feeling that way. I understand, you know, why what's happening here might make you feel that way. And then once kids feel validated that you are invested enough that you, you understand and you're, you're connected to them, then they might be a little more willing to listen to, you know, here are my thoughts on this. Um, and, and and again, these are things that we're always, uh, when it comes to sport, I mean, you know, it's not a tennis emergency, right? It's a tennis match, right? So it, it's okay if it doesn't go well to get today. Um, but, what um, you know, th- this isn't things like, you know, oh, well, I'm trying to understand why you're driving drunk. No, that's not okay. It's never okay. <laughs> I'm not going right. to listen to what you have to say. I'm not going to validate your reason for doing it. You just don't do that, right? But when it comes to sport, right. hey, you know, I feel like I just need a couple weeks off here to recharge my batteries. Well, why do you feel um, that way? What are some of the things? Yeah, I understand that. I felt burnt out too. Um, all right, so how, how should we go about this? You know, things like that, I think, really – will make your kid what happens is when parents do that when they LUV their kids then kids open up more and they share more stuff and you really start getting to the bottom of well what's driving them to do this and this is a skill set that can be developed by parents exactly. right i mean exactly. not everybody and coaches right but not everybody is born knowing how to communicate in this way some of us are better at it than others and for those who don't feel so confident approaching it it's a kind of a fake it till you make it thing you know you you just have to be purposeful about trying it and at some point hopefully it becomes more comfortable and more innate and more automatic and and then lo and behold you're you're having these great conversations with your kid yeah exactly and I learned I mean I I had uh 
in my book, Changing the Game, I wrote a whole chapter on communication and sort of seven little tips for communicating better. And, and I did them in conjunction with a, a long, lifelong friend of mine who's a hostage negotiator. And I'm like, oh, sweet. Wow. You know, if anyone can talk to a teenager, it's a hostage negotiator. <laughs> right? and, and, <laughs> well, what are you so, saying, John? <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah so it, you know it's a good it's a good chapter in the book there of just um you know some some ways to really listen and 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 validate the way your kids are feeling and in a way um it, you know and I, this might not happen as much in something like tennis as it might in soccer where you know a well-intentioned parent says something like you know why does coach play Jenny at forward all the time I think you're a better forward, right? And you're trying to make your daughter feel better, but what she's hearing is my parents don't trust the coach and my parents don't like Jenny, but Jenny's my teammate and I'm supposed to like her and I'm supposed to respect my coach. So that's confusing, right? So, um, you know, again, just how we talk about certain things really, um, you know, can, can, can set this up to be a true educational experience or to go back to the beginning of our talk, just a transaction that it's only about tennis. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think it's very easy, um, especially with an individual sport like tennis, that, you know, we can, we parents um, can get in that mode of making our children usually unintentionally making our children feel as though that's all we care about is how they are as a tennis player rather than who they are as a person. And, you know, so I guess we parents can be transactional as well and need to be very careful when it comes to having conversations with our children about their sport to make it more about them as a person rather than them as the player. Yeah, and and even with the best of intentions, and that's one of the things I think we have to we can we can have the best of intentions and still mess up. And that's okay. I do it all the time. Of, I do it all the yeah, time. Yeah, exactly. All the time. And I, I, I do as well. <laughs> and and again as a coach, as a coach, you know, I am always my my drive home sort of mental internal debrief of how did practice go today oftentimes is for me all about um ah, i should have said you know i should have pulled this player aside afterwards and given her a, a kind word here i shouldn't have said it that way to that to that kid right so uh, yeah every day is an opportunity for me to screw up 50 more times but at least i can kind <laughs> of you know assess it and analyze it and 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 try to be better next time and one of the things that i've been very intentional about in my coaching sometimes before a game is just going up to a player who I know is struggling with confidence and just, and it's not made up, but saying, you know what, I just wanted to say to you before this game how much you've improved and and how much I've noticed how hard you've been working on this thing and this thing, and it's really been showing. And, And to see that player, like it's like this giant burden is lifted off them right before a match, and and they're just like, huh. And, it, you know, more often than not, they go out and they play with freedom and they play with joy and they play better because they're not worried about disappointing someone. And and I think that as parents, like you just said, right, we can never let our kids think that they're disappointing us because they have a bad tennis match or, or they do poorly on a test in school, right? Our love is, is, is much deeper than that. And if it's not, then, you know, our love is transactional as well. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Well, this is a good opportunity to transition into parents coaching their own children and that conversation because, um, I mean, you're a dad and a soccer coach. Have there been times where you've coached your own kids? Oh, yes. Cur- currently I am as well. My daughter's, you know, soccer team, she's 11 years old and I coach her and, um, yeah, it's 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 tough. It's 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 a hard thing um, for her understanding that you know for that ninety minutes, you know, it's coach to player, not dad to daughter. Um, number two, you know, to have conversations about the team or about players, maybe with my my wife or something. Trying not to have it in front of my daughter or that, or you know, understanding that hey, I'm you know I'm the coach, and you might hear me say something on the phone that 
is not appropriate for you to go and share with someone. <laughs> and, and then number three, all, all was, yeah, it, all was checking in with her of, you know, how's this working for you? Is, is, is this okay? Do you still want me to keep coaching? Cause I know I can always be good on the X's and O's side of things, but when you coach your own kids, if it starts to affect their, you know, and may, again, maybe not as much in, in tennis where it's not as much of a team thing, but you know, when, when you're, um, coaching a team and your child goes to school with those kids, if you're really hard and a kid in practice, does that affect their relationship to your, to your son or your daughter in school? Um, or mm. you know, does, it, does your kid have an opportunity, opportunity just to be himself or herself, um, away from mom and dad once in a while? And, and so these are all things that you constantly need to, again, you just check in on and check in on and are these things going okay? And I, I think, um, there, there's plenty of parents that are phenomenal coaches for their kids and then there's others that sometimes, you know, I think the natural tendency when you coach your own kids is to be extra hard on your own kids, which at some point they start feeling like, you know, I can't do anything right here. And all you're thinking as a coach is I don't want anyone to think that I'm playing favorites here, so I'm going to be extra mean to my daughter, or maybe I don't even realize <laughs> I'm being extra mean to my daughter. Um, and, and and that's not a healthy thing either. So no, that's all I can so, <laughs> Yeah. Have you had situations with your daughter since you've been coaching her where she said to you, hey, Dad, you know, knock it off? Um, no, not at this point. Um, but I've also asked her a couple of times and, and, you know, after the fact, I said, you know, hey, Maggie, you know, I made that little comment. And usually it's some sort of like little sarcastic thing um, that – you know, everyone else laughs and, and she laughs and she's got a very good, she, she doesn't take things too seriously, which is great. But we get home and, like, and I'll say to her, hey, Mag, you know, I said that and I kind of feel bad about it. Was that okay? Or would you appreciate me not saying anything about that anymore? And she, and, and she said to me, yeah, you know, if you could not say that, that would be great. You know, so, <laughs> so I, I've, I, I've, I've checked in with her as well. Um, and, uh, you know, I always try to, not coach too sarcastically because sarcasm can can be you know a, a great tool uh, once in a while, but um, it can also you know sarcasm is usually at the expense of <laughs> of someone, and there's better ways to get a point across. Um, but yeah, so again, I I am very conscious about it with my daughter, um, and and in her um, defense, she is very very. Um, She's very open and very, uh, very good natured and, and is willing to laugh at herself as well. So oftentimes she'll poke fun at herself before I even ever get the opportunity to do so. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. You brought up Peter Smith, the men's coach at USC before, and, and I, he's one of my favorites too. He's a great guy. And, um, People one of his don't sons. He's at is, USC now. Yeah. I mean, it's, unbelievable what he's able to do but you know when you when you talk to him about coaching his kids and and not just coaching them in the juniors but like it like you mentioned coaching them in college too were there any challenges specifically that he shared that you know maybe some of us that are thinking about coaching our own kids should be aware of Definitely. You know, one of the things that he shared with me was that he felt his, you know, so we connected when someone had sent him my book, Changing the Game, and he reached out and I didn't know him at that time. And we had a conversation and uh, exchanged some emails. And then I realized who he was. And I'm like, oh, wow, this is, you know, this is a guy who clearly knows what he's doing and what he's talking about. And um, he's won a few national championships. He's, he's won a few national titles. And one of the things that he talked about was just this idea of, when practice is over, practice is over. When the match is over, the match is over, right? And that when your kids are ready to say, hey, dad, or hey, mom, um, you know, what did you think about the match today? That's your invitation to give your feedback. And they're actually ready to take it. But he said when, when he just started ending you know, that, all right, practice is over, now let's go surfing, or um, let's just be dad to son, he said, 
you know, at one point, you know, his oldest was ready to quit tennis. And then all of a sudden, once he backed off, his son all of a sudden took ownership of it again and started practicing more, started playing more, started asking for his input. So I think as adults, uh, again, we come at things with great attention uh, intentions and we and we say things like, uh, you, you know, in our world, the more feedback, the more info we give, the better. But sometimes, especially when we're working with kids, less is more. And and one of my one of my favorite all time quotes is from the book The Inner Game of Tennis by um, Tim Galway, and he says, "Performance is potential minus interference." How someone mm. plays is their potential, you know, you know, their practice, their genetics, all that stuff, minus the things that interfere. And the biggest thing that interferes with performance is between your ears, right? It's a lousy state of mind. And so I think our job as parents and our job as coaches, first and foremost, how much interference can we strip away so a child's potential can show? And if we come at it that way, we realize a lot of t- times when we're piling on, we're just adding interference, not taking it away. Interesting. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. Well, we're down to our last few minutes. I know you've got to run, and um, my listeners, I, I always feel guilty keeping them past the one-hour mark. So I want to make sure to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about your website, your, your coaching conference, and your podcast, and let the listeners know where they can find you. Well, I appreciate that. Um, the, the best place is just go to changingthegameproject.com. And on our website, uh, under the events tab, you'll see our upcoming Way of Champions co- coaching conference, June 2nd to 4th in Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, it's three days on leadership, building culture, mindfulness, meditation, visualization, all that sort of stuff for athletes with Dr. Jerry Lynch and myself. Um, and then, um, and then Jerry and I started this Way of Champions podcast as well. So um, connecting coaches with, with elite athletes, with other top coaches, researchers, sports scientists, people like that, um, so that we can really delve into, you know, what, what, what do the best of the best um, do over and over to get, you know, really good, to build great team cultures and all that. And so you could find Way of Champions podcast on iTunes or any of those type of uh, – podcasty places and but there's also links to it on my website and everything like that and then if anyone has any questions i mean they can find us on changing the game project on facebook or at ctg project hq on twitter awesome and you have an e-newsletter so people can sign up for that on your website as well that's how i keep up with all of your writings and your talks and your podcasts and everything else and so i would encourage my listeners to Go to changingthegameproject.com and sign up to get those notifications when John publishes something new, which you're, you're really good. You don't, like, overwhelm with content, but, you, you know, you time it really well. It's like, oh, I haven't heard anything new from him in a while. Oh, there's something in my inbox. How about that? <laughs> well, I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's an art. I mean, you know, with social media, it's easy to overwhelm your audience. So um, I overwhelm them with content, I should say. Um, so well, thank thanks. you for that. We, we try to um, we try to work hard to give people relevant things to answer the questions that people are asking us. And um, usually if we get the same question over and over and over, it becomes a blog post. And then um, with this uh, – you know, with the podcast now, um, we're able to answer a lot of these questions by, you know, reaching out to just some, some great people that are fun to talk to and, and fun to learn from. So hopefully, yeah, hopefully some of your listeners will jump on as well. And I love your podcast, even though if you anyone here saw me play tennis, you'd be ducking out of the way. <laughs> I have a hard time believing that. I I think you're probably a pretty athletic guy, but... Thanks again for coming on, John. I hope we can do this again in the near future. And in the meantime, I'm going to be checking out the rest of your podcast library. I look forward to listening to the rest of your shows. To my listeners, thanks so much for tuning in, and we'll see you next time on Parenting Aces. 
Don't miss a thing on Parenting Aces. Be sure to sign up for our free e-newsletter so you're among the first to know when a new article is posted. Simply go to ParentingAces.com and enter your email address, then click subscribe in the subscribe for updates box on the right side of the page. I'm Lisa Stone, and you've been listening to the Parenting Aces podcast. For tennis parents, buy a tennis parent. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to us and write a review on iTunes. For more information on navigating the junior and college tennis journey, visit us online at parentingaces.com. As always, a huge thank you to our sponsor, tennisballs.com.